Welcome everyone to uh, EE263. Um, I'm, I'm Stephen Boyd. Um, today, uh, what I'll do is first I'm going to just talk a little bit about the course mechanics um, and just maybe a little bit at a very high level about what the course is and how it's going to how it's going to evolve over the quarter, that sort of thing. Um, and then we'll have sort of a, there's an, in, an intro lecture, which is not representative. So don't get the wrong idea about it. Um, um, so that, that's what we're going to do uh, 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 today. The sections will start up next week, not this week. So the way we're going to the way it's going to work uh, for the class is actually it's going to be pretty straightforward. Um, pretty much everything is going to run through ed. Um, the course website that's here is actually going to be really static. Uh, so uh, you, you know, usually this is something I would be changing three times a day. And my ambition is to change it maybe you know, once a week or maybe even less. Right? So, so this is going to be kind of static. And you'll find stuff on, on uh, ed. Um, so let me, let me just go over some of the uh, prerequisites and stuff like that um, before we uh, jump in here. So first of all, you know, if you want to contact the staff, uh, you could use ed. You can also use as a staff email address, and that goes to all of it. And a plea, unless I mean, unless there's some very specific reason why you don't want to send it to all of the TAs, um, you know, please, please don't send email or something like that to just one TA or something like that, or even worse, just to me, because I'm not that reliable. Uh, and when it goes to the staff address, it goes to all the TAs, and they're reliable. I'm not right. So especially if there's some important thing in the message or whatever. I mean, I'm mostly reliable and I try, but I, I don't, I, no guarantees there. So, um, okay, so let me talk a little bit about the requirements. It's pretty straightforward. I guess there's like three, basically. Um, first is that there's weekly homework. Um, and those are uh, assigned, you know, typically, you know, one week and they're due like the next Friday or something like that. We've actually already assigned the first real one, which is homework one. Um, but don't, I mean, it, it, after today's lecture, if you go and look at it, you might just say, forget it, I'm not taking that class or something, which would be a completely reasonable response to it. So you might want to hold off, but don't, this is not a wait until next Thursday kind of a homework either. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute uh, for the, because, you know, this is actually going to take some time and things like that. Um, there's also a homework zero, which is actually not really a homework. It's more just a, uh, you know, you say who you are, what you're interested in, um, and there's a couple of other things there that I will also talk about uh, shortly. Uh, that mostly just giving you a heads up about some stuff coming up in the in the class. Um, okay, so let's see. There's a um, a midterm quiz, and it's a it's like a 75 minute timed thing. It you know done on on grade scope. And it's the fourth week of the class, and there, there'll be you know th this you know a lot of flexibility in when you take it and all that sort of stuff, right? So oh, uh, generally, for all of these things, um, well, especially for the final and for the midterm, if you've got some really good reason why you can't uh, you know you can't take it in that period, um, you know we'll be happy to have you take it you know like a little bit early or something like that. We'll we'll work with you. I mean within reason, right? What we can't do is actually typically have it afterwards because because at that point we've already returned all these things and all that sort of stuff so um, and I'll say a little bit about the midterm uh, quiz in a, in, in a, in a bit um, and then there's a final exam so the final exam uh, by a tradition I believe it's now it maybe it may there's some questions as to whether it violates university property but it is now tenured or grandfathered so the final exam is in the end of the last week and it's a 24-hour uh, uh, take-home exam, um, and it's it's pretty serious. It's not a you know I mean I maybe you've heard rumors. You just just ask someone who's taken it before, right? So so uh, yeah. I mean look, I'm, I'm I doubt some of you said oh this looks interesting. I think I'll go. I mean I just please well well homework one will make it clear, but you could uh, you know you should. If, if you're, I don't know, just innocent and said, oh, I heard about it, but you didn't ask friends about it, you might not want to ask friends about it. it it's, a, uh, it it's not the easiest way to earn three units. Let me just put it that way. <laughs> um, the class. Uh, but it's also, it's, it's super useful. So it's, um, and I, I'm hoping your friends, it depends who your friends are. If you have good friends, they'll confirm that it's useful. Uh, I mean, people who had taken the class. 
If they don't say that, then you should probably change your friends. Uh, that would be my recommendation. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, and, and the grading is, you know, like the homework is 20%, midterms 15, final exam. I mean, we, we might change these things. I doubt we will. Um, so the class is actually an enormous amount of work, but I don't mind. I mean, you know, it's, I'd probably guess this anyway, or actually you can find out yourself. Uh, the, you know, the final grade distribution is pretty high. So, so the, what we like to think about in the class is you'll work really hard for 10 weeks, finish with this like crazy 24 hour take home exam. I, I think a lot of people, I think of it, a lot of people think of it as actually a very positive experience because it's not one of these nonsense regurgitation things, right? Uh, you know, that chat GPT could easily do, easily do, right? It is not one of those. Okay, you will, the, hopefully you will, you'll finish the 24 hour make, you know, take home exam thinking, wow, I actually learned, I actually did some stuff in the last 24 hours. I mean, it'll be on real applications and things like that. And, and so hopefully you'll actually be tired, but feel good about it. Sort of like, you know, a nice rigorous hike or something. Um, so, okay. So that, that's the final exam. Um, and and uh, by the way, homework uh, zero has something on that because, you know, otherwise, I, yeah, just if you, if, if you have any objection to this, you know, to the idea that, you know, some people come to me and they say like, oh my God, do you realize that, do you realize what fraction of the class is, con you know, what fraction of my grade is concentrating this 24 hour period and what if I don't feel good and all that? I'm like, mm -hmm, okay, fine, whatever. So um, anyway, just, this is just full disclosure. Uh, so, yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> you know, don't take the class if you if if, if that's a if that's a problem. So, um, let's see. Um, now, I'll say a little bit about how the class uh, goes. Um, actually, it's interesting to talk about sort of the trajectory of the class, and this is important. Just and I will remind you at several points during the class. So here's here's the structure of the class. Uh, today doesn't count. It's, it's like an intro overview thing. It's nothing, right? Starting Thursday, maybe even today, depends on the pacing, right? But today we might even start it with the real material. For the first three weeks, the class is basically just math. Okay, so that's cool. I was trained in math, I like math, but I also am pretty well socialized. My parents were English professors, so I knew at an early age, you should do that, but never speak about it in public or something like that. That's fine if you, if you like math. But, so the point is, for I know that we have a lot of people, I mean, we have a lot of people in the, in the room here who are, look, have quite good training in math. Good for you, that's, that's fantastic. And I think that will be entertaining for, for, for those people. I think we have a lot of people who are more interested in sort of applications and they're in a field. And they just wanna know what, can, so to you, the first three weeks is gonna be, like I, if you don't look up three weeks into this class and say, what am I doing? Like, like all my friends told me to take this class, it's like, this is insane. Like, how did I get into this, right? Um, if you don't experience that feeling, then I don't know, there's something weird about you, but maybe not, I mean, it's, it's fine. Um, I'm just, so all I'm saying is expect the first three weeks to just be like a lot of math and you're just thinking like, why, am I, why did I sign up for this class, right? Or something like that, right? Um, that's, that's all completely normal. Um, so that, and, and the midterm quiz kind of caps that, right? So the, in, in the midterm quiz is in fact, you know, it's like a very traditional, you know, silly thing, like a calculus class or something. You, you just have to learn, period. Like, you know, 20 or 30 common convex concave functions. You need to learn the rules about how you combine them and basic stuff like that. And, you know, uh, and then that's all that we're gonna check in this midterm. And that's just basic stuff. Right, that's just like, and we will make no effort whatsoever at making it interesting, okay? <laughs> so none, no. I mean, we tried and it was like it's falling flat. It just doesn't work, right? But trust us, we will do, we're not gonna do any math gratuitously. Uh, we will use all of it. And the class, you know, so if you survive the first three weeks, right? Then I think, then, then, it's, then it gets fun because all of a sudden, oh, also you're not gonna get all the stuff in the first three weeks. For one thing, it's just weird and abstract, and you're like, like, who would care about this, right? Anyway, the answer is you four weeks from now. So that's the answer, okay? So, and you'll see that. So, you know, all these things you're like, I don't care, well, who cares? What's the difference between maximal and maximum? I couldn't care less. Anyway, or who cares if the log determinant? Anyway, what'll happen is we'll transition in the middle of the course 
to doing applications, okay? And then when you do applications, then all of a sudden, what happens is a lot of people tell me the stuff from the beginning of the class, which they kinda got, right? But it's the middle of the class that's submitted. Because once you start using it, you're like, oh yeah, okay, cool. That's the entropy. That's the log of the volume of an ellipsoid. That's something like that, right? And then it starts making, then, then it all makes sense. So that's the other thing to not worry about, right? If you have a sense that A, you signed up for the wrong class from now, and B, you're only getting 70% of it at, at the three week mark, this is normal. Just, I'm just saying it, right? Actually, I might repeat it because a lot of people don't actually really, they're like, oh yeah, that's funny, ha ha ha, but it's real. So, uh, <laughs> well, so we'll see. Um, let's see. Oh, I should say uh, one more thing. Um, this year uh, is actually the first one where we're, we are only gonna support um, Python in the class. So you're going to use CVXPy. Um, there are other, you know, functionally equivalent things, right? There, there, there's, uh, you know, there's convex.jl and Julia. There's CVX and MATLAB. There's CVXR. Um, there's probably maybe a couple of others, right? Um, so, you know, you're welcome to use those if, if you, uh, certainly like if you're in statistics and you use R, what a great, I mean, fire up CVXR just for fun. Um, but it, what it means is that post-class, you have some, some stuff you can use, right? That, that's good. But for this class, it's not gonna, we're not gonna support it. Um, by the way, a lot of the um, old homework exams, uh, sorry, a lot of the homework problems were old homework uh, final exam problems, right? Um, and a lot of them do have support for other, you know, like for MATLAB or Julia or something like that. And you know, if you're curious and you want to shadow it uh, in some other language, by all means, go ahead. But just just to be completely clear about it, you will be using CVXPy, right? So, and if you know, it depends on your learning style. But you know, it depends if you're, you know, depends on your learning style. But maybe next week, early next week, you, you can just you can pip install CVXPy or whatever, or, or Conda, whatever it is, however it's installed, right? So, okay, um, let's see, let me see if there's anything else I've, I've missed about this. Any, any questions about how it's Yes. Well, I guess it's not like, maybe you touched on it a little bit, but say for example, I didn't take EE263, how, what should I oh. be thinking about right now? Uh, right, okay. What should I prepare uh, myself for? Okay, okay, so, uh, you know, EE263 is not actually a pre I didn't say anything about prerequisites, so let me say something about that. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so, you know, the prerequisites is actually mostly just kind of some matur mathematical maturity, right? So you don't have to have seen any applications that we're gonna cover because we'll, we'll give you all the details for all of them, right? Now, of course, by the way, the flip side of that is if you're in a field and we're covering it, you're gonna be cringing because of all the gross simplifications and how, and by the way, and you're welcome to, you know, uh, to, to, to uh, you know, either, you, I, I can usually tell like who's an expert and when I'm talking about something, because people are going like, oh my God, like, oh no, no, how could he? Anyway, so, but you're welcome to uh, pipe up at that. In fact, I may even call on, on you. If I detect that you are an expert in something I am currently butchering, I, I, will, I will actually possibly call on you to make a comment or something like that, if, okay. Um, so, uh, so you should know some linear, some linear algebra. We expect a uh, probability yeah. th th those two are like just non-negotiable, right? We, we're not going to sit down, have someone say, what's a density or something, right? So, um, and you know, that means it's these days, you know, if you took some kind of nonsense machine learning class where you didn't learn anything and that's your full, and you think you now know linear algebra and probability, you're wrong <laughs> and you will find out. Okay. Uh, but you know, I mean, if you nothing wrong with that class, with those classes, but you take that class and you actually know a few other things, and you'll be fine, right? So these are not hard, hard prerequisites by any means at all. Um, trying to think what else you'd need to know. Oh, uh, you know, obviously, you can't be afraid of firing up a Python notebook. Um, you will not do actual programming because you're going to write scripts that are like ten lines long. I mean, basically, so. That to me, that doesn't cross over the threshold of programming. Uh, so, you know, but you have to know what a notebook is and know your way a little around, a little bit around Python and object-oriented things. But it's you know that's that's all. So so nothing nothing fancy, nothing advanced. Um, okay, let's see what else. Uh, there's one more thing I was going to mention, and that is, and you'll see this on homework one. So uh, so the TA, TAs and I we've been having a lot of fun with um, 
chat GPT. I mean, us and a million other people, right? But anyway, so we have typed in interesting, you know, like actually for, for, uh, homework problems, final exam problems. And uh, in, I mean, and you know, there was actually one final exam problem. It was a very straightforward one where it actually came up with a completely reasonable solution and generated code that ran. Okay, but that's, that's cool because that was, we, we have a category of final exam problem where it just goes like this. We just tell you exactly what to do. We say, here's a field, you have to decide these things. You know, here's this, you know, flux balance constraint. Here's this thing. Here's another constraint. Here's the objective. And then what happens is you just assemble it, write it into six lines of uh, Python and run it. And, and presumably there's an example there that shows you, you just did something good, right? Like, like a, if it's an image thing, like a smiley face comes up or so, I don't know, that kind of thing, right? Um, so uh, we have those. Um, actually once I had a hilarious thing where someone turned in his final and I said, how was it? And he said, yeah, I mean, problem three. I was like, problem three, that was like, a, that was like we told you exactly. He said, yeah, but I didn't trust you. Uh, <laughs> it was like, I read it, I did it. I said, yeah, but did the smiley face come up? And he goes, yeah, it came up, sure. And I said, well, that's it. That was the whole problem. That was nothing else. And he said like, yeah, but you're kind of devious. And I, th I thought maybe, maybe it would be just like you to put something that looks like it was totally straightforward, but actually wasn't. Anyway, so, so anyway, so just heads up. Some of them are just straight. Anyway, the rest of the, um, ah, okay. The, uh, I'll have to fix this. Um, the, uh, okay. Um, the, 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 however, the, on the rest, it produced the most hilarious stuff ever. It was just completely awesome. It was beautifully written and 100% wrong. It was just, which is actually for me a little, because you know, usually when you see things that are totally wrong, they're also poorly written. So there's a bit of a correlation there. When you see things beautifully written, it's typically someone knows what they're doing. So this was like a beautiful, weird, like combination of like beautifully written and utterly and totally wrong from beginning to end. Okay, so, which is cool, but uh, okay. So uh, a couple of us who teach this class and similar to Merit Palangi, um, we, we want to actually train a, a, I mean, it can't be that hard to train one of these large language models to do this kind of stuff, at least the basic stuff, and be correct, right? Um, I mean, if they can train it to emit, you know, code that executes mostly, right? Then they can definitely get the basics of convex analysis right, okay? So anyway, so to do that, we want to actually use the discussion forum that we will use for this quarter, at the end of the quarter, uh, to train something like that. And then, you know, who knows what'll happen, but it might be kind of cool to actually come up with something that'd be like a live thing that people would do and could ask questions and, you know, we won't need TAs anymore or something. <laughs> I, I don't know, I mean, although I have to say, from the things I've seen, we definitely still need TAs. But, but so you're safe for this quarter, for sure, don't worry. Uh, but. You know, anyway, so that's the idea. And, and for that, you know, we had some hilarious conversations with the University Privacy Office and, 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 and it ended up with us uh, on Homework Zero asking whether you're okay with using your, 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 your chat things, which I mean, I mean, and you're welcome to say no and you can change your mind later. But I mean, like it's all, it would be all anonymized. No one would know anything and stuff like that. So, okay, so all, all cool. So I think that might cover pretty much everything. Any questions? Yeah. I'm just gonna be planting some incorrect answers in uh, the Ed discussion. Just <laughs> yeah, that would be good. Thank you very much. That would be very good. Yeah, yeah. So that 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 would be good. Yeah. So we'll. Uh, yeah. No, they're really. They're, it's really entertaining. But I, my feeling is, I think they can get it right. So I guess part of it is the beginning of the class is just because there's just not that many things you need to know. Right. And so it's sort of like, you know, learning how to decline verbs in Spanish or something like that. I mean, it's just it's mechanic. I mean, like, you know, you don't need a you probably don't need a live teacher to do this. And for that matter, pronouncing correctly, like getting your tones in Chinese correctly, that can be automated now, too. Right. So there is no, you know, so my feeling is like in some weird way, the first three weeks of this class, which are kind of just those two things, I mean, similar. Uh, could actually be at some point like quasi automated or at least we'd have a lot of help doing it and stuff like that which would be i think it'd be kind of cool 
because um, then we could jump in. Yes. How much probability? Basic. You need to know like probability 101, but you really need to know it. Right. Well, I mean, it's very basic stuff. You need to know what a density is, what a CDF is, what conditioning is, what independence really means. You know, so it's it's all one probability one. If we go beyond that, we prepare you with, we'll remind you like what a moment generating function is or something like that, right? So, yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Any? Yeah. Compared to the like YouTube version, because this has been recorded in the past. Yeah. yeah. How different are the lectures? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah. So let me let me say a little bit about what what's available online. Oh, the first thing is you it it will take you about four seconds to find usually weird old versions of uh, solutions of the homework, which I, you know whatever I mean you can get them or not. That's not the point. the 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 point of the homework, which I would you know. It's actually very important. It doesn't count for much. You read it takes a long time. Um, actually, those problems all started as final exam problems. That that that's where they all came from, right? So so so, the people at one point said, "Hey, the final exam's coming up. I'm nervous. How do I train for it?" And I'm like, "Dude, you've been doing final exam problems the entire quarter. That's what do you think? What do you think the homework? Is? I mean, we modify them a little bit because." You know, if it's a homework problem, we can be a little more vague and I don't know, it could be more, more of a pain in the ass, take longer to solve, that kind of thing. So, you know, but, but the point is there's some editing in style, but roughly speaking, that's, that's what they are. So, um, and there, I'd actually, I mean, I kind of recommend uh, if, you, if, it, if, if it works for your learning style, uh, working, in, working on the homework in groups, right? And so that, I mean, again, that's if that's your learning style, that's a good way to do it. Um, if you do that, collect yourself a group um, of, of, of people. Uh, you do not want the people in your group to be polite. Don't want that. So the worst thing that could happen is, you know, because you learn by explaining, right? At least that's how I learn. And so, you know, what will happen is if you have a if you have a polite group and you explain this, and they go like, "Oh yeah, yeah, totally. Oh yeah, sure, yeah." I, and and like what you want, you want someone in your group is like, "Sorry, I didn't understand one thing you said." Right, and that's a hint, right? I mean, if, if that's all they ever say, you can kick them out of your group, but, <laughs> but the point is that's actually what you want. Okay, something, something like that, yeah. Um, oh, I should say a little bit more, uh, I'll, I'll say this a little bit more about backgrounds and stuff like that. So we have people from 20 departments in this class right now, right? So, uh, which is really cool. So, and for me, it's super fun because it's basically, it is a cross-cultural experience. <clears throat> that's a cross-mathematical cultural experience. Right, so you know it's kind of fun, right? You maybe you do, I don't know, genetics, and the person next to you does like drones or something, or somebody does machine learning. I don't know, or you know, economics. So um, it's fun, and uh, and there are a bit, there are a few rules there. So like, uh, I what we do there. I mean, these are this kind of the standard obvious rules, right? If you walk in a room, and basically not everyone speaks Tamil, you don't, you switch to English. I mean, hello, right? That's how, that's just normal, right? So um, the same thing here, right? So there's, we're gonna see a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of different fields that use this, a whole lot of them, right? And actually a lot of them have dialects, including the ones I come from. I mean, strong dialects, right? That, by the way, no field thinks they have a dialect. But in fact, they all have, and some are like Hick dialects, I can tell you. That, like, you know, statistics has a dialect, it does. Uh, econ, terrible one. Oh my God. Uh, uh, signal processing, that's like physics. Oh my God, don't even get me started on that. Uh, machine learning is just uh, just off scale. Like I don't even know where that came from. Uh, I guess it's from not knowing the basics or something. Very. Well. I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I don't, like how I, I don't know where you would. But you know, I I'm fluent in several of these dialects, but not all. But I understand a lot of them, and I recognize I, I would recognize them, so I could you know. Intervene. So, but the rules apply here, right? If you're if 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 you find yourself in a small group and everybody speaks signal processing, feel free to switch to signal processing dialect by all means or machine learning, whatever you like, right? But you know, if a normal person shows up, you switch to what we call high BBC mathematics. Okay, so that means you speak, you know, at 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 this level using a lexicon and language that anyone mathematically trained should understand. Because that, that's, how, that's how you go back. If I talk to someone in finance and they start blabbering stuff and I have no idea what they're talking about, I was like, whoa, dude, let's, let's slow, slow down, right? I'd say, what does that even mean? Like, and then 
Theoretically, we can all back up until we get to math, and then, then they can say it. Then, then they can hopefully explain what they're trying to say, right? So that's kind of what we're going to do. But well, every now and then, actually, just for cultural enrichment, I might mention some uh, dialect things. Also, that's for your so that's a social advantage for you because if you find yourself at a party and all of a sudden there you are with a bunch of like quants, you just I'll tell you a couple of words you drop and they'll go like what uh, like that. So it's just that's just for fun though, that's for cultural enrichment. So okay, um, all right. Now I think I have covered everything. <laughs> uh, any 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 questions about it? Okay, so we're gonna jump into just an, a, a big overview lecture. Um, and don't get the wrong idea. This is absolutely not representative. It's sort of a, it, it, first of all, I'll go fast. I won't define a lot of terms, which is not what's going to happen during the class. Everything I'm about to talk about, we will talk about in hideous detail in the next like four to five weeks. So don't worry about that. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's, that's, so this is not representative, uh, but we'll go over it, right? So, okay. So I'll start with just a quick informal introduction to you know, what is mathematical optimization. We'll talk about actually probably the two most important uh, problem classes there are. Least squares is for sure number one. And number two, I think would probably be um, linear programming. We'll talk about that. Um, and then in fact, uh, the, the parent of, of those is actually convex optimization. So we'll get to that, which is, which is, which is more. So it's just to orient you into how, you know, what is the whole, what's the, what's the big picture, okay? Um, and I'll, I'll say a little bit, we'll look at a little example and stuff like that. And I'll say a little, I'll say a little bit about a brief history of it. So, okay. So um, here's what an optimization problem is. And, and I'm going to, uh, you know, we'll go over this a lot more in much more detail later, right? But so now this is just a quick, Quick, fast introduction. Okay, so um, you know, so it's an optimization problem that looks like this, and, and there's some critical components. Number one is you have to have uh, something called the optimization variable. Um, actually, so here's a here's a, a phrase people use in like management science for this and operations research. They call these the decision variables, which is a fantastic name because it tells you these are the things you need to choose, right? So that's decision variable, but that's dialect. Right, so people in math would say like, what are you talking, would not know what that means, okay? So, um, so you, have, you have the variables that, that you're gonna choose. Um, and then you have a couple of components. And by the way, I, I actually think of a problem in, in my own mind. Uh, by the way, minimize is not min, right? Min is a mathematical operator. It has only one definition and has always only had one definition. It is, it takes as argument a finite set of numbers and it returns the smallest one period. That's what min is, okay? Minimize is actually a different thing. I mean, it's similar idea, right? I actually think of this as a constructor for a problem. <laughs> that's really what that is. So I actually think of this in an object-oriented way, and I believe that's absolutely the correct way to do it. So a, an optimization problem is, is actually, it's an object in an object-oriented language, right? And it has different attributes and fields, right? It's got an objective. Um, so it's got an objective and it's got constraints. And so let me explain a little bit about how that works. I have a function f0. That's going to be our objective function here. And you know what that is? That I mean, one way one way people describe this, I think it's a really good description actually, is they call that it's a best effort situation. Best effort means whatever value of f0 of x you come up with, we'll accept it. Okay. By the way, the smaller it is or the more negative it is, the happier we are, right? But we'll but we'll accept it. Right, so that that's what that that that's what, so that's kind of it's you just do your best on that, okay? Now the constraints these are predicates. So a predicate is a mathematical expression that evaluates to either true or false, right? So they're either satisfied or they're not. And the predicates describe constraints. And these are some you know sometimes people call this hard constraints, right, or something like that, because the semantics is really really simple. The semantics is this: if someone proposes an x and one of these is violated, and it doesn't matter by how much, then it is completely unacceptable. Okay, so that's the, that, that, that is the semantics of a constraint. I mean, you know, it depends. We'll see, that we see, we'll see where constraints come from in the wild. Um, they can come from different places and have different attributes. You know, sometimes it's like it's a, it's a physics thing, like, or it's something like, actually, guess what? You know, covariance matrices are positive semi-definite. 
So please don't give me one that's either not symmetric or has a negative eigenvalue. Thank you, kind of thing. Um, or it could be just a modest preference, like please keep the leverage on my portfolio less than 6.7. And you'd say, well, we had a good day and some things went up and now it's 6.8. Whatever, right? So we'll, we'll talk about those later. But that's the, that's the meaning of a, of, of, of a constraint. Okay. And then a solution or optimal point, right? Uh, X star, right? Uh, that's a star and not a little asterisk, right? So um, asterisk is going to be reserved for some other concepts we're going to see later in the class, which are really cool, but not now. So, um, so star sort of means optimal here. And what it means is it, it has the smallest objective value among all choices that, that satisfy the constraints. Okay, so I mean, I'm just, this is obvious and you should kind of know this anyway or something. And you've probably seen this in lots of fields, but that's, that's what it is. Okay, so that's an optimization problem. Um, okay, there, there you go. Oh, and of course, there's tons of variations which we'll look at. You could maximize something Typically, if you maximize, it's something like a utility or a profit or something like that, right? Or, you know, or whatever, some, or a score or something like that. You would max, that's, okay, but we'll, we'll look at those variations uh, later. Okay, so let, let's first look at some examples about, you know, uh, by the way, you'll see tons of examples before the, the course is over, right? Um, okay, so... I mean, here's one, let's do portfolio optimization, right? So you wanna construct a portfolio of, let's say, you know, 5,000 assets, right? And so what that means is you have to decide how much of each of these do you hold, right? And it could be negative. That means like a short position, right? And you don't have to know what I'm talking about, it's fine, but that, that, that's what that would mean. A negative short position means you actually borrowed it from someone but had the obligation to pay it back later. And that actually is the same as owning a negative number of shares, okay? That's a short position. Again, you don't need to know that or whatever. I mean, well, you, you will see all this. That's just for cultural enrichment. part of, consider that part of cultural enrichment, right? If you're, if you're not in that field. Okay, so your job is to choose how much do you put in. And, you know, presumably there's a budget, like please invest a billion dollars or something like that or some, something like that. Um, there could be uh, things like a minimum and maximum allowed investment, like please don't put any more than 10% of your total portfolio in any one name. That would be, that was, I just said that in dialect, okay? That, uh, but I think you knew what I meant, right? Um, you know, there, there could be uh, a minimum expected return. You could say, I'd like to make at least 8% a year. Uh, at least that's my expectation according to my various models, right? Something like that. The constraints might be, well, I mentioned one already, a budget, um, you know, a minimum return. And the objective, you know, might be something like the overall risk um, or the risk is a dialect for the variance of the return, right? So, so that's what you'd do. So you'd say among all portfolios, you know, with a leverage less than 3.6, with blah, 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 with this thing, with that thing, with you know, n no positions more than, you know, 0.1, meaning whatever, you know, you can't hold 10% in, in any one name, that kind of stuff. It says, among all those, please find me the one with minimum risk according to some risk model, which is a typically a, a variance model, okay? So that's that's that. Okay, that that's, and it's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of any, I am not aware of any quantitative hedge fund that doesn't simply use convex optimization to do this. So I'm not aware of one. Okay, they may exist, but that's pathetic actually, if you ask me, but anyway, fine. Um, okay, here's another one, just to switch signs, uh, switch, switch, switch areas and switch. So there's device sizing and electronic circuits, right? So, you know, everybody's wearing a lot of electronics. I, I got a lot on, on me, I got a lot in front of me and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, when people are designing the actual integrated circuits, I mean, at the, de at the detailed inner level, uh, digital or analog, uh, there's a point where people do uh, analog size. Actually, this optimization is used throughout circuit design, throughout, right? So maybe not for like super hardcore, small analog stuff where it's still like kind of old cowboys, you know, coming up with a weird circuit from 1927 or something, you know, that was vacuum tubes and now it's in whatever uh, CMOS. But, but, you know, for the stuff that's on, that you have around you, sizing is a big deal. Right? And so the idea there is, 
I might have a logic block inside a chip where, and again, you don't have to, again, like when we talk about these things for real, I'll say more, but now it's just, you should just get the flavor of it, right? So I have a logic block inside a chip. I have, let's say, I don't know, a million gates inside, right? And the, its job is really simple, right? A bunch of ones and zeros are gonna come active on, at, uh, at the input to this block, and some number of you know, picoseconds later, uh, we hope that whatever that block computes is a bunch of ones and zeros that comes, it's gonna come out by the deadline uh, on, on the right-hand side where it's gonna be latched into some new latches, right? And again, if you know what I'm talking about, great. If you don't, that's fine too, okay? So, but, so, so that's a timing requirement and it's unbelievably important. So, or here would be the slang. Um, I wanna make sure this can clock at 2.8 gigahertz this core, right? So that's, that would be the slang, right? But that translates into a timing requirement. That's, that's what it means, right? Okay, now the basic idea is that for each, each of your million gates, let's say, you can actually change like its size, right? You, if you make it big, here's the good news. It's fast. You make them big, they're fast. Why? Because a lot of current can come in and charge up the capacitance fast and it's gonna be fast. That's the good news. Bad news? It's big physically, right? And you've got a limit on area. Other bad news is it's power hungry. And you know, so, and, and, and actually that's kind of, the power is kind of the, the, the limiting thing right now in a lot of circuit design, okay? Okay, so now the idea is, I mean, it's kind of roughly, it's obvious what to do intuitively, right? You, you know, for the, for the, I'll tell you, here's some slang, right? For the critical paths, those are the ones that says, you know, I tell you what, here's what's, and for your time, for timing to clock at 2.8 gigahertz, your hardest thing is going to be the signal that flows from these things over to those over there. Those are the critical paths. You're going to want to size those big because you want to want to make sure that with high probability, the, uh, the signal's valid when, when the next clock cycle comes around, right? Um, and for things that are less so, you're going to want to set them to minimum size, right? Something like, so I mean, this is kind of obvious. Uh, but, but, but this is actually all done by, you know, by optimization. Okay, so all that kind of makes sense? So, okay. Um, so that's one. Uh, and then the last example is kind of hilarious because it subsumes pretty much most of statistics and machine learning. Um, it's just called data fitting. Okay, so, and it's this, you know, here the variables are parameters in a model. Could be a statistical model, a prediction model, whatever, it just, it's, a, it's a model of something, right? And you got parameters. If you're doing land of old school statistics, you might have 10. And if you're, you know, training a neural network, you might have 10 billion. Okay. So th that's, th th but those are your, those are the variables in an optimization problem. And then the constraints might be, you know, based on prior information. Like if you're estimating, for example, an intensity, it's got to be positive. It can't be negative, right? If you're estimating a covariance matrix, it's got to be positive semi-definite. So these are like constraints. Um, uh, let's see. And your objective typically involves two things. Um, the first is a, a measure of misfit with the data you have, the training data, right? So that's the first thing. Like if someone says, what are you doing? You say, I'm fitting a model. You go, how you're doing it? And you go, well, I mean, the first thing is I wanted to reproduce the data I have. Then the critical part, so, I mean, cause you know, if you're not, if you're not doing well on the historical data, you know, you should just give up or something like that, right? Time to go home. But if, uh, but then, then there's another term and someone says, well, what's that other term? And you go, ah, that's a regularization or a detuning term or uh, in optimization, you call it a term that promotes robustness. And someone says, oh, what's that? And you say, wait, do you mean you're not actually choosing the parameters to do the best on the data, you, on the historical data? And you're right, you say, right, exactly, right? Because I don't want to overfit or something like that. And I'm sure you've seen all these ideas, but. Anyway, but that's, that's another example where, you know, people would use optimization. What, what's super interesting is just to think a little bit about um, how the variables enter in, in these three broad categories, right? Like here, it's actually prescriptive. Like you, when you calculate this, you get a trade list and it says, go buy so many shares of this, dump that, dump, buy, buy this, buy that, you know, that kind of thing, right? So that's prescriptive. So things actually happen, right? I mean, another good example of that would be control. Right, so that's another big, huge example here. That'd be like, you know, uh, landing a rocket, flying a rocket, flying an airplane, uh, autonomous driving, right? There, there, it's prescriptive, 
right? You're actually, here are the optimization variables. It's actually the, uh, it's actually literally the four thrusts on, on your drone uh, in 20 millisecond increments for the next 10 seconds. And things happen. Like when, when you come up with an X or whatever it is, right? You download it in your drone and it, go, it flies, okay? So same here. Um, here, I mean, things happen. It's just on a much smaller time scale, right? The, sorry, sorry, longer time scale, much longer time scale, right? So electronic design, people design bridges. This is how people design bridges and big buildings and steel structures and things like that, right? Um, you, you know, you spend a lot of time working it out and simulating it like crazy. And then, then you, you build the thing and you're hoping it's going to stay there for a hundred years or 200 years, that kind of thing. I mean, not for a circuit, right? That's for a building. For a circuit, you're, ho you're hoping it's going to last like four or five years, right? Something like that. Um, and then in data fitting, the variables are not actions at all. They're actually, they, they, nothing happens, right? If I show you a coefficient in a regression model or something, you, you don't do something, it's just a, it's just a parameter, right? So I think it's, it's interesting to sort of think about this. But there's a lot of other applications of, of optimization, which we, which we will see that don't, you know, that aren't, but these are just kind of good, basic, simple you know, examples. Okay. Um, okay, so general opt. So you might ask, yeah. Oh, by the way, uh, a lot of times it's very normal when per people learn about this first is to wake up, kind of in sweating a little bit in the middle of the night, and go like, and you're like, oh my god, everything is an optimization problem. Oh my god, <laughs> right? Okay, so should this happen to you? It's going to happen to one or two of you. I can guarantee it. Okay, just statistically. Okay, so just calm down. Uh, Here's the deal. Yes, duh, everything is an optimization problem. Of course it is. Then not only it's both true and says nothing. It's, it's like a tautology, like, of course, right? So, you know, um, okay. So now the, uh, so then the question is once you, once you realize what's well, everything, like it's, it's absolutely everything. It's all of design. It's all of statistics. It's all of, you know, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. Um, then you ask yourself, okay, cool. Now that's really interesting now. Can you solve it? And now we get to the bad news, which is no, generally you can't. So sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's okay. And you know, and there, there's, there's, there's different types of ways to get around that. There's, uh, there's two traditional compromises, one taken 99% of 99.9% .9 of the time and 1.1% of the time. Um, the, the first compromise is actually uh, to, to actually solve, and then you have a little asterisk, and then down at the footnote, in extremely small font, it says basically, not really, or, or something like that, right? So that's, that's fine. And I'm, I'm not making fun of this, but I'm just saying that this is, this is like a whole lot of people do this. Um, and it, it's fine. It just means that you, you found a point that was feasible, it has a better, let's, let's say it has a better objective value than what you started with and you're happy, right? But, you know, is it the absolute best anyone can do? You don't know, right? I mean, if you're honest, right? So that, that, that's that. That's called local optimization. It's very widely used. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, it's, it's fine. I mean, as long as you don't pretend that you've actually solved a problem, then we get into trouble, right? So, uh, and there's lots of cases where that doesn't even really matter. I mean, it's fine. So actually right now, as we speak, there's like millions, 10 million local optimization, maybe more than that, local optimization problems are running right now. So someone want to tell me what, what they are? What are local optimizations running right now? 10 million of them, a minimum 10 million. On GPUs all over the world? In other, maybe? No, people are fitting. Go ahead. Neural neural, oh, yeah, people are fitting neural networks. Yeah, so there, 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 there you go. And they don't, they don't care that, that uh, like, no one comes up to you and says, wow, that's, that's awesome. Is that the absolute best you could do? And by the way, the reason you might not care, there's a lot of reasons you might not care. You say, number one, I made up the objective. That's, that's, the, that's the first thing. So we shouldn't get too crazy about that, right? Number two, the objective is merely a surrogate for what I really want to do. And you go, what do you really want to do? What I really want to do is make excellent day ahead predictions. That's what I really want to do. All this optimization stuff, all this, this machine learning optimization crap, that's just a way to get there. So I, you're not paid to minimize loss functions if you're doing machine learning. You're paid to do a good job on tomorrow's data, on unseen data, right? So, so there's lots of reasons why you could say you couldn't care less 
in, in many, many cases. And that's all perfectly valid. Okay. Now, there are some exceptions, and I'm going to talk about them, and that's actually kind of what this course is about. Okay. So the exceptions are there are certain kind of problems that you can just solve. Right? There, there's no art of any kind whatsoever. It's a technology. You just solve it. Right? I mean, if you push these things to the extremes and blah, 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 there might be some minimal art. Uh, but, you know, fine. Um, and, you know, the most famous one is the least squares problem. I'll talk about that. That goes back to about, officially to about eight, year 1800, but it's almost certain that people knew about it way before that. Okay? And I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll say a lot about it. Um, uh, another one is linear programming problems. And of course, convex optimization problems is, is another example. Now, for these things, you, for these problems, you saw, when, when you say you've solved it, there's no asterisk, right? There's no, the, you, you, you don't pull in the legal boilerplate, right? The, the release that, you know, when you read in small writing or the thing you said when you said agree, it was like way, way down where you didn't read it. It said things we understand that this may not be the best X, blah, 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 right? That kind of thing. But th that's what this is, okay? So there's nothing, they just work, right? By the way, what's super interesting about that is that makes them really suitable for embedded applications, right? So uh, that's like, you know, I, I mean, I was joking with a friend, like if you got on a flight and the captain said, you know, great news. You know, today uh, we're going to see some interesting weather, and we're going to be, you know, training our RL uh, controller. It's going to be real fun, right? <laughs> I mean, this is ridiculous, right? Right? Or, or I mean, so actually, a lot of jet engines work this way. You actually solve an optimization problem 50 times a second. They're really complicated. A jet engine. There's like, you know, 50 different at things. The the X that you're choosing is like at least dimension 20. It's like all sorts of crazy little bleed valves and things, and you can change the, the angle of attack on road. It's just crazy stuff. Uh, fuel mix, all sorts of crazy stuff you can do to run a, to run a jet, and they're very serious. Here's what happens. It actually solves a convex problem 50 times a second, right? And notice I said not a neural network. <laughs> so, uh, nevertheless, that's and that's that that's because these things they just they just work, right? So they're very good for that kind of stuff. Okay, so, um, but it's probably better not to get all weird about it and and say things like you know like oh what are you doing? I'm solving a convex problem. I get the actual global solution. You know blah 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 blah. And oh you're oh wow look at you you're oh. Is that is that stochastic gradient descent? Oh, okay. You know, it's 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 better not to get too bent out of shape about all these things, right? Okay, okay. So let's start with least squares. Um, so like I said, least squares goes back to um, around 1800 with Gauss and Legendre, <clears throat> um, like maybe Lagrange. I can't remember who was involved in this, um, and that's of course the Western mythology. So I mean, almost certainly it was known in India or China for sure. Uh, and, and in various other ancient places, Persia for sure. Okay, so I, you know, anyway, so this is, you know, this it has a least square solution. By the way, because it has a least square solution, that means it's taught. It's taught by people from this who have this kind of 19th century math training, which is most people uh, who teach. You know, you write down the formula and a lot of paper and pencil kind of stuff. You know, just like their parents did and their grandparents and their great grandparents, that kind of stuff. So it's that kind of, it's fine. And we shouldn't make too much fun of it because a lot of stuff was built that way, right? Um, so, you know, it's just an analytical solution if A, whatever, if A has full rank and is tall. Um, and there's lots of reliable and efficient algorithms and software to do this. And, uh, you know, basically you can solve this in a time which is proportional to, uh, actually, this is a theme that you will uh, know later in the class very well. It's the big time small squared theme. Um, there's two dimensions here, right? There's the number of rows. That, that's, that's the number of terms in your least squares problem. And x, this is the dimension of x. That's the number of variables you have, right? Uh, which is n here, OK? Um, and uh, you know, the computation time for this is, you know, is, is, is nothing. And, and, and if, if A is structured like it's sparse, you can do this even faster. And it's still, but you can do these at just stunning speeds, I'm sure people here know. Like, you know, it, it's absolutely not, it's, it is nothing to solve a problem with, you know, 10 million entries and, you know, a couple of hundred, uh, uh, I, I, and, and a couple of hundred parameters, or by the way, the other way around with regularization. It's just absolutely nothing. I can do that on a laptop, okay? 
And then what, what can we do on a GPU? Like, don't even get me started, right? So, I mean, you, so these things are really uh, pretty crazy. Okay, so that's a mature technology. Um, and um, yeah, how do you, you know, so the question is, how do you lose, use least squared? It's actually a really good question. You could teach a super awesome two week short course on it, which is basically like, that's least squares, we can solve them. End of story, no more, you don't do the silly theory and stuff like that, because it's totally irrelevant, right? So you just say, that's it, it's a fact, we can solve ginormous least squares problems. You can right now, right? You know, when uh, you don't even need torch to do, you could solve just gigantic problems. And then you'd say, I'm gonna show you some street fighting tricks for least squares, and you will be empowered. Okay, so you could, I, this course doesn't exist, but it'd be awesome if it did. And there's just like, you learn about three or four tricks, and you are good to go. Uh, yeah, the, the tricks are things like throwing in weights on different, different, uh, different data entries. I mean, which is silly. Um, regularization and adding terms. Like you'd say, oh, I like the trajectory I got for my airplane, but you know, there's too much rudder movement. And you're like, fine, throw in an additional least squares term on rudder movement, right? So these are the kinds of street fighting things people do. And it's really pretty cool, right? So everybody got this? So, so you know, you learn a handful of tricks and least squares and, and you, are, you are good to go, right? And uh, in, in a lot of practical problems. Uh, we should also not make fun of it uh, because it runs most certainly most of last century's technology, right? I mean, come on, look, in statistics, it's called regression. Don't make fun of it because regression models are like really widely used and perfectly good. It's, it's the basis, I mean, it gets fancier and stuff like, it's the basis of, of the actual control that's used, right? Which is not, of course, RL, <laughs> if any of you thought that that was the case, right? That's a joke. Uh, so you know, the actual control that's used on, you know, vehicles, generators, things like that, uh, you know, anything, it's all around you. That's all basically, you know, kind of sort of infinite dimensional variations on least squares. Um, filtering, signal, traditional signal processing, all least squares, okay? Equalization, all these things. So it, it's easy to make, you know, you, you, you kind of want to make fun of it, but I wouldn't because it's run, it, it ran, it, it, it's, got, it's running most of the technology we have right now and, and pretty well, thank you. Right? So could you do a little bit better with convex? You can, yeah. But let's be humble a little bit, okay? In some cases, right? So, okay. So that's least squares. Um, linear programming, this is super interesting. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious, it depends on your background, but how many people have not seen linear programming, which is perfectly okay, it has nothing to do with you? Okay, cool, what's your background? Uh, civil. civil engineering. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm doing like structural engineering. Oh, um, this, like, it's all it's all LP. That's like, how do you? Oh yeah. That's how do you design fun. structures? I don't get it. I okay. use, I'm using um, genetic algorithms right now, so I'm ah, away from oh, that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, 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 okay, okay, okay. You're okay. That's fine. Okay, that's fine. That's right here. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. Okay. Great. That's fine. Okay. So, all right. So linear programming. So, you know, I'm from a more mathematical background and we don't hear, you didn't hear about it because, you know, there's no analytical formula for it. Um, even worse, most of the algorithms that work for it, no one can explain why. I mean, they can, but it's like, you know, a hundred pages of dense math and I don't even know if I believe that that actually explains why it works, right? So it, it's, there's, there's some weird snobbery there. But linear programming is just the dumbest thing ever. It says minimize a linear function subject to a bunch of constraints that are um, linear inequalities. And so, you know, the classic, we're gonna go over this in hideous detail, right? But, you know, it would look, it would look something like this. If these are your, uh, you know, these are the constraint sets. And basically it says you have to stay in here, right? That, that's the feasible set, right? And then there'll be an objective, right? And the objective will be you, this is C, let's say. And so it says, please go as far as possible in this direction. And so the solution is like here. Right, and you know this is kind of uh, we're we're going to go over this in great detail. Um, this is fine, um, but the main point is you can do this in um, I, I can do this when the dimension of x is a million, and the number of constraints is ten million. Okay, and we, I, we can just do it. It's just a non-problem. Um, by the way, if I have a a small linear program with let's say I don't know let's say a thousand variables, and five thousand linear inequality constraints. Everybody picturing this? Right. So, by the way, you can't picture it, duh, hello, you can't, but you can pretend to, 
And that's what, that's what we do. So we're going to pretend to visualize in R1000, right? Uh, 5,000 half spaces, right? So now what you're, vi what you're seeing is this big old polyhedron in, in R1000, right? Okay. Um, now, you know, it's kind of obvious from this that the solution is, you can find a solution on a, on a vertex, which is a, you know, one of these corner points, okay? So then the question is, well, I, I just have to look at the vertices. This thing has like, you know, whatever, one, two, three, four vertices, right? We just check each one and find out which has the best value, right? So how many vertices does a polyhedron with a thousand variables defined by 5,000 inequalities have? I mean, just roughly, right? Like a thousand, five thousand? Just roughly. Just guessing. Just guess. Um, so the answer is it's about five thousand choose one thousand. Um, that's a really, really big number, just for the record, right? Um, and I can solve that problem in about 50 milliseconds on my laptop. Okay, so, so and you're like, whoa! You went through, you know, you actually like, you know, you can, you can make it sound all fancy and stuff when you explain what you've actually done, but you know, that's it. So anyway, this is pretty cool. Okay. Um, okay. So, you know, there's really good different methods to do this. As a matter of fact, by the end of the class, you'll probably implement your own uh, only to demystify it. That, that's the only reason. Otherwise you go through your entire life, you know, with people telling you like, oh my God, you can't, it's extremely hard to solve a linear program. Oh my God, you know, you have to use this, you know, commercial software and, you know, get out your visa card and pay. It's like, like, then you, you know, then you'll be able to say, dude, I implemented one on a homework. Okay. So anyway, fine. And it was fine. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, okay. Once, it, by the way, once again, you get the weird big time, small squared thing, right? Um, if, if there's a hundred variables and 10,000 inequalities, the complexity is, is, is that. Um, and that's a, that it, it's so it's a very much, it's a mature technology It's used all the time. Ever, it's used for supply chain. It's used for all sorts of other crazy stuff, like, all, like all the time. Um, it's used for scheduling a lot of stuff, right? So, okay. Um, now it gets, a, it gets kind of interesting, right? Because you'd think to detect a linear program is kind of easy, but it turns out there's a whole bunch of problems that you can transform. If you know a few tricks, you will know them in a few weeks. If you know a few tricks, you can transform like a problem that doesn't even, that doesn't remotely sound like an LP into an LP. And by the way, and the way we think of that, that's actually kind of the way it works in this class, right? If we reduce your practical problem to a convex problem, we declare success. We just say, done. Yeah. And then if the person comes back and says, yeah, but we need to do it for gigantic ones, then, you know, we can help out making it work. Or they say, no, we have to do it for hard real time. It has to be done in 20 milliseconds, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay, whatever. But the point is, bottom zeroth order, you reduce it to convex, is done. Right? And that actually kind of fits. Uh, I mean, I think that's more than just a joke. It's actually kind of real. That every time, historically, when someone put something, formulates something as a convex problem and what people wanted to scale it or make it, you know, unbelievably reliable or something, they were able to do it. Okay, so that's an example. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Um, and then that gets us to our, our, you know, what the class is about, which is convex optimization. And so um, it's all about, this is what, I mean, kind of weird that the entire class is about this, but the, so it's actually very weird. Uh, it's, a, it's a mild uh, generalization of being, uh, well, affine, right? And here, I'll try to use the notation uh, here. It's, it basically uh, says that f of you know, alpha x plus beta y is less than or equal to alpha of x, f of x plus beta f of y. Now, there's some rules here. Alpha, beta have to be positive, and they have to sum to 1. OK? So roughly speaking, this means, and you know, obviously, we'll go over the whole, the rest of all this later. Um, but, you know, in, in one dimension, basically it says that the curvature, it, it has to curve up. That's all it means. It has positive curvature, non-negative curvature. Okay? So, so the entire class is about optimization with things that have non-negative curvature. That's the entire class. Um, what's weird, it is weird when you first hear about this, is that there's some weird asymmetry. That is very weird, right? So, because the classical thinking is, you know, if things, 
if, if everything is linear, oh, that's linear programming. In fact, in classical Western optimization, the way people think of it is there's linear programming and then are you ready for the other one? That's called nonlinear programming. And you're supposed to go, ooh, wow, that's really complicated and blah, blah, blah. Okay, everybody got it? So it turns out that view of the world is just stupid and wrong. Okay. And the, the weird thing, what's really weird is it's this. It turns out curvature, right, which is nonlinearity, turns out it's, this is weird asymmetry. And, and non-negative curvature is just fine. But, you know, negative curvature, that does make it hard. So this is just not, this is not, I don't think this is obvious ahead of time, right? This is kind of an interesting part about it, right? So, okay. So that's a convex optimization problem where all the functions look like that. Um, and, you know, it's like linear programming. There, you know, there's analytical solutions for about 17 of these. And really, who cares about those anyway, right? So, you know, least squares and, you know, I could name a couple of other famous ones. You know, you encounter one in your information theory or your communications class. You know, in statistics you get, you, you see a couple. But, I mean, it's whatever. It's fine. Um, they're reliable and efficient algorithms. Um, and, you know, you, it, it's, kind of, and it, it's kind of almost a technology. It's not quite. Oh, that reminds me to say something about, but, but, well, well, we can, I'll say it again when we get to it later. Um, later in the class, within three weeks, you'll actually be like solving problems, okay? Um, they will most, it will mostly work, the software, like 99.5% of the time, something like that. Um, it will fail sometimes, but actually you don't know it, but by agreeing to be in this class, again, if you scroll down that thing that you agreed, uh, which you can't find anymore, because we actually didn't do that. But anyway, if you, if you look in there, it basically says that you know, while you're in the class at least, you agree to do the following. If it doesn't work, you may only discuss that when people in the class are present. If like a roommate says, what are you doing? And let's say you're swearing at the laptop because it's not working. They say, oh, I'm doing convex optimization. And they say, is it not working? You are obligated to say, it's convex optimization. Of course, it works perfectly. Well, you say, hello, excuse me, that's the point of the class. That's the point of the field. It of course it works. And they go, then why are you scream why are you swearing at your laptop? And you go, oh, uh, it's not doing what I thought it would, or something like that. Anyway, so anyway, so I mean, I'm just saying that's the way it's gonna work. Right. So, but it should be a technology, and actually it can easily be made a technology, right? So it's embedded in all sorts of stuff that you wouldn't. <laughs> that you know, it 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 it's in automate. It it it's in uh, it's in UAVs. It's in lots and lots of stuff uh, where uh, and there is no human intervention, right? It's running at you know things like a hundred hertz or something like that. So things work that way. So um, okay. Um, now here's where it gets interesting. Um, so the question then comes down to okay, cool. How do I know if my problem is convex? That, that's a great question. It turns out that's actually not easy to do. That, that, that's actually interesting, right? That, that, that it's not, you know, like how do I know if my problem is a linear program? That's actually quite straightforward, right? How do I know if it's, it, it's yeah, and you'll see, there'll be, you know, so that's why we're gonna spend the next three weeks, you know, going into some uh, horrible math. But the whole point is that you, learn to recognize convex functions, right? And, and, and that sort of stuff, that, that's gonna be the key. Um, and it turns out, you know, it turns out a lot of problems can be solved uh, using this, right? Um, okay, so let's look at a quick example, just for uh, fun here. Um, you know, like yeah, quasi practical, actually, it, it does come from something real. But um, so here's the problem is, so I, I have a bunch of uh, lamps here that, that you know, spray out illumination. Um, and there's some surface that I want to illuminate here, right? And um, I'm, I'm going to assume that the, the light is incoherent or whatever, so the powers are going to add, right? They're going to add uh, linearly. And it turns out that the intensity, here's a patch, and the intensity here is uh, simply, it's linear in the, the lamp powers, right? And so uh, AKJ gives you the number tells you it's the coefficient of the, the amount of illumination you get on patch K for, let's say, one watt put in to uh, lamp J, okay? 
So, and you know, look, here's a, here's a baby formula, inverse square thing, you know, because it's propagating in 3D. And the cosine, this is like the cosine shading angle. It doesn't matter. And if, if your patch is, is here and the light is here, you don't have a direct thing. So it's zero, right? So that's what, okay. So that's, that, that's what it is. Um, and <clears throat> the question here is to choose these lamp powers. I mean, they've obviously got to be non-negative. This problem would be a lot easier if you had lamps that could spew negative light. That, that would be a huge innovation. Um, yeah, so spray darkness, I guess, right? So, okay. Uh, and they have some maximum value. And <laughs> what you want is, you know, someone has said, I want uniform illumination at this level called I desired. I care about proportional, so I'm gonna take logs. And I'd say make, mi minimize the maximum uh, fractional error across this, right? So that's, that, that's the problem, right? So that's a, this is like a typical real problem. It actually came from something real. It's fine. That's it. That's, that, that's the problem. The question is, how do you do this, right? And you know, this wouldn't be a problem. I mean, people, you know, engineers are actually pretty good. Um, you know, the first thing someone would do, I would hope, would be to do things like this to, uh, you know, first of all, they have a simulator. And the first thing they would do is they'd fire up the simulator and you should just put in uniform power and then turn it up and down and see how well you do, right? Um, then they'd say, oh, you know, I know I know least squares, so I'm gonna do least squares, right? Because this is kind of least squares. There's a matrix there that maps the uh, powers to the illuminations, so I'm gonna do least squares, right? Um, now, what's gonna happen uh, when you do least squares is some of the powers are gonna come out negative. I mean, duh. Right. And then, you know, you're just, this is, I'm just, this is street fighting. This is someone who just has to do this. Right. They're like, you know, I, I just need to find these illuminations. You know, if it's negative, you just set that lamp to zero or something. And if it's above your, if it's above the maximum power, you clip it at the maximum power. Right. And, you know, so something like this would, it would do something. I don't know what it wouldn't probably not terrible. Right. And then you'd say, well, no, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do weighted least squares. And the way I'm going to do it is, I'm gonna have this least squares objective here, but that's another least squares objective. And what it does, if you think about it, is there's the interval each of those powers has to be in, which is between zero and P max. And what this is, is it, it, it pulls you towards the center of that interval. So if you're too low, like your negative power, it pulls you towards zero. If you're positive, if you're, if you're above the maximum, it pulls you down towards the maximum. Everybody got that? And so you might do, you might solve this, you might solve this problem and then here would be a completely reasonable way to do this. If P is below negative, you know, increase its, increase, uh, you know, you, you say WJ times equals two, okay? I'm just making, this is what people would do. This is the kind of thing somebody would do. If, if it's above the maximum, W times equals two, okay? If you're in the band, W divided by equals two. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Okay, so you just do that, okay? And you know, something is gonna happen. It's not gonna be too bad. Uh, and you know, that's how a lot of stuff actually works this way, right? I, as I told you, you, you could actually have a perfectly good life doing a lot of mathematical stuff. If the only thing you actually really knew well was least squares, plus you knew some street fighting tricks, right? So you'd be just fine. Um, okay. Somebody could say, maybe they came from management science or OR and they go, Hey, that looks just like a, that looks just like, uh, an LP or, or something I can solve with LP. Oh, except for the log, right? And so they might do something like this, and you, you do pretty well. And these are just approximate solutions, but probably not too bad. Everybody following this? I, I mention this because this is kind of how stuff act, a lot of stuff actually works. You know, people are good. They'll, they'll do what they need, and clever. Okay. So it turns out the whole thing is just, it's just convex, period. The whole thing. So, I mean, you exponentiate the objective, and it's just convex. Um, and it's not obvious, and people probably don't know that. So... This is the function that is the fractional error. And let me explain that, right? So uh, u is like the, u is the ratio of one thing, two positive things, right? If it's one, they're equal, and that's the minimum. If you could subtract one if you want here and make this zero, right? Um, but if you increase it above that, then your fractional error grows linearly. If you decrease it, it's like one over u, right? So, so this is, I think you could call this, what, 100% error or something, and if I were down here, the 50% error points would be one half and uh, I don't know, 1.5. No, somehow that didn't come out right. Okay, scrap that, right? But anyway, you get the idea. 
Okay. But the main thing here, and the only thing you should be able to do now is take your eyeball and say, that, that curves upward, that's convex. Okay. So make, make sense. So that's the, uh, that, that's the idea. Um, so you, you get the exact solution and I mean, it's just, you know, not a problem. And now for fun, uh, I'll add some constraints to it and we'll check what happens. Um, so two proposed constraints, right? The first is that no more than half the total power is in any 10 lamps. I could probably make up some kind of practical reason why you might impose a constraint like that. But usually constraints like that are just made up by people who have no idea what they're doing. And so they just made it up, right? So um, the second is this, no more than half the lamps are on, okay? So by the way, that gets us to something very interesting, which is actually, suppose you were designing, suppose you were designing like a building or a lab experiment or something, who knows, a piece of equipment, and you wanted to choose where to put the lights. So you could very reasonably do something like solve this problem with a million potential light locations, but, but you'd like to solve it <clears throat> with 990 of the, or whatever, you know, with 99% with of them, zero, right? Because if a lamp is zero, it means you didn't need it, okay? And in fact, people design structures that way. You, you, you take a big old structure, you, you put in way too many bars or a space frame, you put way too many bars in you're gonna need, and your variables are the cross-sectional areas, okay? And what you're hoping, you, then you'd say, it's gotta, it's gotta support my loads, it's gotta have my, it has to satisfy these dynamic, you know, blah, blah, blah. And what you're hoping, you have no intention of building a bridge with 100 million bars, right? And you know, then if you're lucky, it comes out and it, it's, the solution is sparse. And, and, and congratulations, you just designed the topology of the truss. Okay, I don't know if that made sense, but that was, okay, Architects fine. Architects love you. What? Architects love you too. Yeah. Because they, you're not you know, using material. Yeah, yeah, no, no, exactly. So, okay, all right. So I'll just, uh, you know, I mean, here it's, it's here. So it turns out these two look very similar, don't they? And they both look kind of weird and combinatorial, right? Like you would, I mean, later in the class, you, would, you might say, I don't know, they, all, they both look kind of hard, right? So it turns out um, this one is convex. It's very weird, but it is. And the second one is not. I could repeat this. I could transcribe this to any field you like, right? Like it would be construct me a portfolio, right? Of 10,000 assets, world market or whatever. But I don't want to have more than a, I don't want to hold up more than a hundred names. That's an example of that. That's actually hard. But I could say, I could put a concentration in a, I could say things like this. I don't want more than 5% of my portfolio to live in any collection of 100 names. Everybody follow that? And someone says, why would you do that? And you go, that's an anti-concentration, you know, blah, 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 inequality, constraint. Anyway, that one's convex, it's just convex, right? So, okay, I, I, this is weird, but it actually tells you a very important point. It's, it's actually why you're here, and it's why the class is not like two lectures. Uh, be, because, so I, I like to think of it this way. The, your, uh, in fact, that's part of what the class is about. We are going to break your idea about what's easy and what's hard for an optimization problem. Because unless you know the things you're gonna know in this class, you are wrong. And it is not obvious. That's, that's, that's I think, it was kind of interesting, right? Like if I show you a linear program and I tell you, oh my God, you know, it's got this dimensions, there's more vertices than the number of subatomic particles in the universe. And, and you're like, whoa, whoa, boy, oh, whoa. You know, and then I'd say, yeah, I, I can solve that in 50 milliseconds on my phone, okay? So it's just, I'm just saying these things are not obvious. They're weird. Uh, so, so, or another way that I, I, I would usually say something like this, that this is, uh, I guess, problem complexity is not continuous in the intuition norm. That's the way to say it, right? So it means two things can look intuitively to be very similar. You're like, yeah, whatever. They, they look about the same, but one can be really hard and one is really easy, right? So that, that's, that, that, that's, that's the idea. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Okay, so this is this example. I'll just say a little bit about the course goals and then I think we'll, 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 we'll just finish up today. So, you know, the, the main goal is to, to be able to recognize uh, convex problems, right? Um, 
And the, so the reason is, it, it is not going to happen to you that you go to an internship or a startup or something and someone says, whoa, I have this optimization problem. I think it might be kind of, it's not going to happen. What's going to happen is they're going to come to you and it's going to be unbelievably complicated. And they're going to say, oh, do you know about like, you know, mortgage swap derivative, you know, options and blah, and you're like, oh. And then they'd say, well, yeah, here's the basics of this and here's that and here's that. And, oh yeah, here's a giant book, read that. And an intern fit this model and you're like, whoa. whoa. So it's going to be really complicated. This, this is the way it really works, right? And it's going to be your job to cut through all the noise, sit back, come back the next day and go, it's done. I can schedule, I can schedule your EV charging. And they'll go, what do you mean? It's really complicated. Like, you know, we have limits on the total amount of power here and blah, blah, blah. And different people, different customers have different goals about when they want so much charge. And you're like, it's done. You'll just say it's done. So that, so that, that's what we're training you for. Uh, so um, that actually, weirdly, that actually happens. Like I've actually had students come back to me the fall, <laughs> the next year. One came back and I was like, what, what is it? And he said, you said, yeah, you know, you rant and rave about that. He said, we just thought you were just telling stories and being weird and stuff. I was like, yeah, mostly I am. And he said, he said, yeah, but what he said actually really happened to me. Like I actually really went and they said, oh, we want to make this regression model. It's super complicated and there's this and that and you have to do this and that. And there's causality and you, you can't use this before that. And let's remember that the Hong Kong thing, those prices close before this opens. And you're like, whoa. Anyway, turned out it was just convex, the whole thing. <laughs> And I said, well, what happened then? And he said, I was, the, I was the superstar intern, right? And he said, actually, it was finished in about a week. But anyway, so it's just that it actually does happen, just to let you know. Um, okay. Um, and then, uh, it, you know, it's very much the class, the focus is in no way whatsoever on the theory. There's extremely interesting theory here. But we, there's, there's no, we're not interested in that. We're actually interested in solving problems. Um, and so, you know, you will have practice writing these 10 line scripts. Uh, you, you can't get out of here. You will have done signal processing. You'll do machine learning. You're going to do control. You're going to do uh, portfolio construction. You're going to do, uh, you're going to find bounds on arbitrage free bounds on prices. You're, I, who, I don't know what you're going to do, but you're going to do a lot of weird practical stuff. I mean, kind of sandbox versions of things, but still they will be completely real. Uh, so. That's going to be kind of the 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 focus of the of the class, and and that's kind of what we're uh, what we're trying to to produce, right? So maybe at the end of the class, you know, we're going to make it all very simple. It's going to be kind of a um, you're going to be in a sandbox. We'll pre-digest stuff. It'll it'll be fine, but and then maybe at the end of the class, once once you've mastered all of those things, then I'll 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 tell you some um, maybe some secret street fighting tricks before you go out into the wild. But I'll make you sign a release saying you didn't learn those things from me. So, uh, so we'll 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 do that a, a, a bit later. So, so that's really the goal of the class is 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 to learn these things. Um, that so, I'm gonna quit here, but I am gonna say one thing. Bear in mind that when we come back Thursday, the tone is gonna change completely. Like you might be thinking, oh, this is actually kind of interesting. This is gonna be a fun class. Wait till Thursday. We're going in way deep and it is not, it, well, it'll be weird, but anyway, you'll see. <laughs>